the Oklahoma City Thunder extend head coach Mark Degnault, why he is the head coach of the future for this young up-and-coming Thunder team. Plus, a couple youngsters will join Team USA, and let's try once again to figure out this roster crunch dilemma in Oklahoma City. All that and more coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Prize Picks. We're diving into Mark Dagnall getting a contract extension. Chet and J Dub both being named to Team USA Select, and an update on the roster crunch dilemma. That will take us through this summer off season. Again, today's show is brought to you by Price Picks. First time users can receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars with code locked on. That's pricepicks.com promo code locked on. Now, let's get right into it. So the Thunder have signed Mark to a multi-year contract extension. Her team policy, of course. No actual details are released. We just know it's a multi-year deal. The bottom line is Mark Dignall is a head coach of the future for the Oklahoma City Thunder. At 37 years old, he's coached 236 games, a 86 and 150 record. He finished second in coach of the year voting behind uh, Mike Brown of the Kings, breaking, of course, their playoff streak, well-deserved uh, by the Kings head coach. But in my opinion, as I said, in January of his first season, as the head coach for the Thunder, which is only a month into the gig for him, if you remember that crazy season that started in December, he is the best coach in Thunder history because he has a way to make these guys play hard for him. And, and on the surface, that take might have some sticker shock to it, but the, the competition is P.J. Carlissimo, Scott Brooks, and Billy Donovan. And I think that Mark clears all of those head coaches. These guys play in, incredibly hard for him. Mark has this unique ability to not only relate to the players, but get them to buy in. When you're you know, talking to these players, they, they sound just like Mark. They use Markisms all the time whenever they're describing situations, describing games, describing circumstances. And you can see that buy-in not only in the coach-speak verbiage that these players use pre, post, and at practice but you can see it on the court and you've always been able to see it on the court. Some of those extraordinarily bad Oklahoma city teams on paper played extremely hard and overperformed. In fact, every team he's ever had overperformed what they should have done on paper. Both, you know, you can argue in the win column his whole career, but, but especially with the eye test. So his record of 86 and 150 is very misleading. Obviously, that's not the best start in Thunder history as a head coach, but it doesn't provide the context of, you know, the team was trying to lose the first couple of games, um, and also the context of even while trying to lose, it was evident that this team was playing above their skis and was well coached. And you look around at other tanking teams, that's not the case hardly ever. You hardly ever get a team that is tanking that you look at and say is well coached that you look at and say they're playing hard night in and night out, no matter who's on the floor. And so you surround Mark with talent this season, and he was able to create a winning culture and a positive environment for a team that had many chances to fold. So this was the youngest team in the NBA. Many people projected them to not make the play and not make the playoffs. And in fact, you know, some of them projected to, to be a 24, 25 win team again. So when you take in those expectations and you factor in that a month before training camp, 
Chet gets hurt and he's out for the season after looking so good in summer league where, you know, you had Kevin Durant and other stars tweeting about him and the anticipation was mounting high on Chet and the buzz was back in Bricktown around this team. Chet gets hurt out for the entire season before the season even begins. Could have folded right there. Did not. Had a four-game losing streak in November. Could have folded. Did not. A five-game losing streak in December. After that five-game losing streak, they rattled off their best basketball. Then you deal with the Shea injury, where he has an abdominal injury, and he gets COVID, and when he returns, you know, it's of course he's laboring. He can't play back-to-backs. They had that awful post-All-Star game stretch that started in Utah where they lost at the buzzer and then continued on where, you know, even after they survived that post-All-Star game stretch, got that massive win against the Clippers, the Lou Dort lockup game. After that moment where we thought, hey, you know, this, this is it. You know, they've turned the corner. This young team still lost, you know, six of their last eight games. I'm sorry, they lost eight games of that stretch. You know, the, the stretch after that Clippers win, they lost six games and only got two wins in that eight-game stretch. But they still fought to the end. They regrouped, and they were able to battle it out in Utah again and, and, and against, uh, you know, teams. And, of course, the Mavericks battled out of the race, and the Thunder got to the play-in. And then in that play-in, in that postseason game, on the road with the youngest team in the NBA, guys who, you know, many of them had never been asked to win games before in the NBA. Uh, you know, it just been it's, it's to that point it had been roll out the ball, have fun, develop, let's see what happens. With a rookie center, quote unquote center, Jay Will out there limiting Valanciunas. You had the buy-in from Shea to not only produce 30 points per game, but become an excellent defender according to Synergy. And like the eye test tells you he's a great defender too. Whatever you mentioned you want to use on the SGA, his defense is leaps and bounds. Um, ahead and the lock in there to have the buy-in to play defense, have the buy-in to be tops in the league in deflections, tops in the league in uh, diving for loose balls. The toughness and going back to where the team could have folded. You had all these things happen. Then you lost Poku, who's a good rotational player uh, right before the new year and still had your best stretch of basketball after he was out. And you lost Kenneth Williams, who was vital to the team's success the entire year. And so no matter what, the NBA threw at Mark and the Thunder last year, they weathered the storm, they survived it, and they were well coached. And routinely throughout his entire career, the, the Thunder have well outperformed on defense without any resistance in the middle to speak of in his entire career, much less last year. It was a big deal last year because the Thunder were actually winning games. But the entire time, Mark's been in OKC. They've had little to no resistance in the middle, except for the handful of games that Al Horford played. And the team runs great offensive action, which allows Shea to dominate without it feeling as heliocentric as it could feel for a guy who scores 30 points and gets to the line 10 times a night. You know, they're still sharing the wealth. They're still getting everyone involved. They're still um, playing team basketball. And so there were a lot of questions whenever he was hired. And, and remember that hiring process was, was kind of weird too, where the season starts in December, uh, Billy Donovan and the Thunder mutually part ways over some Diet Cokes, and he goes to Chicago. And then a week before the November draft that year, the Thunder still were without a coach. And there was rumors that it would be Will Weaver, and there was just speculation on who it would be. Will the Thunder go into the draft without a head coach? And then, boom, they hire uh, their G League head coach, and then, of course, he was assistant for uh, Donovan uh, the bubble season as well. But, you know, a, a Billy Donovan guy in Mark, and he took it and he ran with it. This is a guy that got hired in November as head coach was ready and up for the challenge to start training camp about three weeks after he was hired and then go and play basketball and be a well-functioning team in December, in middle of December. So like that's a that's a pretty incredible accomplishment. Then you have a shrunk-paid offseason. Your first offseason as a head coach. Last offseason, you, of course, lose your second overall pick but still get better. And now this offseason is more of a normal off season. This, this feels more normal for OKC and it's a more clear off season. Like, you know, regardless of coach speak and anything else, it's difficult to coach whenever you're not really sure how the team is going to, you know, develop and how the, what the team's expectations are and what, what the goal is at the end of it. 
right? Is the goal going to be to shut it down or is the goal going to be ramp it up? Let's get to the postseason. And now that is clear. Like you can head into media day training camp at the end of September and know for sure we're getting to the postseason or at least trying to. Like that's the goal. No one's worried about winning too many games. Nobody's worried about being put in an awkward position where you're going to have to decide midway through what to do with this unit. Like the goal is get to the postseason. And so that's this is going to be the first time in his head coaching career that he can worry about those sort of things. And now he's got to balance worrying about that with still developing some young talent. But nonetheless, despite all the questionings, even up to you know this past you know few months. Mark is absolutely the head coach of the future, and this multi-year contract staples that. We'll talk more about Mark, talk about the youngsters playing in Team USA and the roster dilemma all coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, but good friends over at Prize Picks. Folks, go to prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. You can get a hundred percent deposit match up to hundred dollars So you put in fifty dollars, you get fifty also from prize picks. So it's that easy to use once you use the code locked on to me. Prize picks just makes watching these games more fun because you go there and you pick two to six players and you just guess will they score more or less than their prize pick projections. And if you're right, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. There's no competing with other players who are just smarter or better than you at fantasy sports. It's simply you versus the projected numbers. And you can, you know, guess on NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, Men's college basketball, women's college basketball, WNBA, soccer, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Eurobasket, cricket, and more. Go there right now because entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Safe offers fast withdrawals, and it's currently operational in over 30 states in Canada. So check it out today by going to prizepicks.com or the PrizePicks app using code locked on 100% deposit match up to We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. I appreciate you everydayers who check in with us every single time around. And Mark gets the multi-year extension. He, he gets the label as coach of the future. And now the attention will shift to his first playoff series, his first opportunity where there's no more of this, oh, we're not game planning for anybody. Oh, we're only working on internal development. It's now go time. You've got a game plan for your opposition. You've got to make adjustments towards your opposition. You've got to get your group ready to go for possibly seven games against the same exact team. And the Thunder have been good in baseball-style series, even going back to his first year and all the way through up until this year. Early on in this season, they, they, they took on the Clippers, took advantage of, of some – you know, injury report mess with the Clippers and swept them early in the year to kind of set the tone a little bit. They've been good in baseball style series settings. And so that, that doesn't necessarily translate, of course, to playoff series, but just a little glimmer of a taste of, of what a playoff series could look like in the adjustments game to game in that environment. But now that's the next big thing because the bottom line is the major, the vast majority of people, fans, media, anyone, they don't really care what a coach does and don't really like, highlight anything positive that they, that they do until they do it positively or negatively uh, in the postseason, in the playoffs, you know, in a, in a series, because it's just easier for people to notice it in a series because you're truly watching seven straight games of the same team, same players, same rotations, and seeing what, what, what else change around the, around the margins in that time. So that's the next test for them. And hopefully for the thunder, they can get there this year. Uh, but Nonetheless, credit to Mark for getting the multi-year contract extension. Chet Holmgren and J-Dub are on Team USA Select, so they're going to be going to training camp in Vegas for Team USA uh, this first week of August, and they are eligible to travel to FIBA World Cup games, which is huge, and they can play in those FIBA World Cup games if someone gets hurt or you know a veteran pulls out for any reason whatsoever to pull out for any personal reasons that might be going on. So if somebody drops out, then Chet or J-Dub uh, – they're eligible to take their spot. Now, of course, there's other players on select, so they're also eligible, but it's pretty cool to even have the shot to play for Team USA at such a young age. And the biggest thing here for me is that players have routinely talked about how much just simply being around Team USA has helped them dramatically at improving their games, has helped them develop. And that is a common, common, common 
sentiment from players. And with the work ethic of J-Dub and Chet and the way that people describe both of them, and the way they describe Chet as a basketball junkie, as a sponge who just loves to get information overload on basketball, I'm super excited to hear about their experiences, what they've learned in these kind of iron sharpen iron type of situations with Team USA. What's their biggest takeaway? What are they working on? What, what are they seeing whenever they're going up against you know, proven NBA players, of course, working on their craft and practice? Getting, getting talked with and coached with by Steve Kerr and, and by that staff that he's going to assemble. So it's obviously very exciting. It is obviously uh, something that we don't know if it'll pan out in the sense of um, getting to watch anything because they, they would need an injury or someone to pull out to even have the chance to be promoted. But I do think that, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if they still do this, but I think at one point, Team USA, like around the beginning of training camp, had like a scrimmage against each other and it was broadcasted on ESPN. That might be for like the Olympics only, though. It might not be for the FIBA World Cup, uh, but maybe we'll see if that happens or not. I'm not sure if that will happen. And I could honestly just be dreaming that, but I want to believe that uh, I remember the Paul George year that they had um, a, like a scrimmage type thing that was broadcasted. So maybe these practice players can play in that uh, and get some footage of them there. And of course, there's going to be packed practice footage. There's already practice footage of uh, Josh Giddy and Jack White putting in work, getting ready for the FIBA World Cup. So that was a lot of fun uh, to to see that nutmeg pass from Josh Giddy. But this is going to be a, a, an awesome time for them. They're going to soak it up, and this is obviously, hopefully, going to be a growing relationship with Team USA as these two mature in their careers. So the big thing is is this roster crunch. That is the biggest story you could say that's happening right now in Oklahoma city. And I've talked on the last couple of podcasts about the idea that the thunder have too many picks or that they have too many players or that um, the NBA teams are ready to pounce on them. The bottom line is the thunder have been carrying the maximum amount of players possible for the last three off seasons. This is what they do. And the thunder want this internal development. They want this competition. They want these tough decisions. They welcome them. And so here's the roster right now. And you tell me if you still believe the Thunder have too many good players or too many picks or whatever. The roster right now is SGA, Josh Giddy, Lou Dort, J Dub, Chet Holmgren, Kaysen Wallace, Kenny Hustle, Michich, Joe, J Will, Wiggins, Usman Jang, Poku, Trey Mann, Jeremiah Robertson Earl, Davis Bertans, Victor Ladipo, Jack White, Ty Ty Washington, Usman Garuba, and Keontae Johnson. And now when it comes to cutting players, Keontae Johnson does not factor in here. So you only have 20 players on standard deals. you got to cut it down to 15. So you've got to move five guys who are on standard contracts. And some names on the chopping block would be Victor Oladipo, Usman Jang. I mean, I'm sorry. Nope. 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 Names on the chopping block would be Victor Oladipo, Usman Garuba. Mixed up the Usmans there. Ty Ty Washington, Jack White, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, Trey Mann, and Davis Bertans. Some things to consider with that chopping block. Number one, obviously, you need to get five cuts out of those seven names, and you still have two open two-way slots. Davis Bertans, I don't really think should be considered on the chopping block. I honestly only put him on there because I do not want the comment section to be like, well, what about Davis Bertans? Why isn't he on the chopping block? Well, I, I don't believe he truly is on the chopping block. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be overly stunning, but the value of his contract and the spot minutes that he can give. It doesn't make a lot of sense to cut that, uh, you know, and you want to ensure he doesn't play that 75 game clip uh, as well. So I just think that Bertans will survive this roster crunch. Consider also that Trey Mann is a first round pick by this organization. And I think that that matters. I think that, I think that in the business of basketball, it matters what you invest in these players and the optics and um, you know, the, the egos at times, can impact decisions like you, you you can you know right wrong or indifferent you can see you know hey we we invested a first round pick on this guy if we cut him if we move on from him for nothing it kind of shows that we missed and i want to be right so like let's keep him around and keep developing him it, that i think that that is a is a you know part of the decision making process uh, jack white from from all accounts jack white is on this kind of non-guaranteed really as little financial impact as you can possibly have uh and is in his I think going to be able to be waived uh, and placed on a two-way deal uh, because of, you know, him making 75 K or less. I think that he'll be 
he'll be in that range of 75k or less i think um and that would allow the thunder to wave him and then funnel him to a two-way deal uh and and kind of bring him into the organization that way and you can think of this it's not apples to apples obviously but you can think of this as the sweetheart deal that the thunder usually do on the back end only on the front end it's like usually the thunder will do something like with, with what they did with eugene of converting him to a standard contract you know midway through last year and then immediately cutting him and he goes to detroit um and instead, it's kind of the reverse of that. Jack White gets a little bit of a pay increase. I don't think as much as Eugene got, but a little bit of a pay increase. And then it's on a two-way deal, uh, kind of in the reverse order. Again, not apples to apples, but it's a small way to think about it. And the Thunder have cut guys that they've signed in the summer in training camp before. This, this would not be the first time that they've done this as an organization. Then you have Ty Ty Washington, Usman Garuba, and Victor Oladipo, who were paid to get moved. And in the case of Ty Ty and Gruba, twice they were paid to be unloaded. And you had the fact that Victor is just not healthy right now. And so when you're trying to consider what to do with these decisions, would Victor Ladipo want to be a leader on a young team and, and be a voice of reason and um, try to provide any sort of expertise from the sidelines that he can? Or would he rather go rehab on his own and try to hook on with a contender later on in the season, whenever he's healthy? Those are some things that he has to he has to consider. The Thunder have to consider. Everybody needs to consider that. And then you have the fact that I don't think the Thunder are just itching to make a ton of moves. They did wave Rudy uh, Gay last week, but I think that that was more so instead of them itching to like just get off these guys, it was just more so hey, housekeeping. We got to move on from Rudy Gay that we can officially sign Jack White and get him officially added. And this was exactly what they did. They officially added Jack White you know, with a press release last week so coming up what camp battles should you watch for and who are my picks to be released from the organization we're back on the lockdown thunder podcast on the lockdown podcast network your team every day thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning every single day we're here for you talking thunder basketball we're talking roster projection right now our roster projection 2.0 how is it different from version one? And what do you see happening? Drop it down below in the comments on YouTube or on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. So the training camp battles, I think that there's a couple. And this is just pure speculation. And it's just thinking out loud. But I don't think that the Thunder are eager to move on from these guys right away. I think that their vision is to have this competitive training camp. And if you break it down into battles of these guys on the bubble, it, it seems like maybe you're going to battle between Ty Ty Washington versus Trey Mann and let the best guard win, the best young guard who, who needs to catch back on in the NBA win and, and kind of improve from last year win. And then you've got a battle that I'm not sure, you know, how to how to break it down in the sense of, Usman Gruba versus Jeremiah Rumpson Earl versus Jack White of like Usman Gruba is a big man that gives you a totally different look than what you have on your roster. Jeremiah Rumpson Earl is a, is a, you know, kind of smaller big man. And then Jack White is a super small big man that plays bigger than he is. And that uh, can provide you some kind of uh, scrappiness to the team. Plus you have the connection with Jack White and Josh Giddy and the friendship there. So I, I think that in training camp, it, they're going to roll the ball out there and see, like, does Ty Ty take and, and earn this job over Trey Mann or vice versa? Does one of Usman, Jerry, or Jack White pop and force our hand to, 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 to cut someone else? What happens here? And building, you know, that kind of training camp environment has been the situation this whole time. So my picks to get cut, Victor Oladipo owed nine and a half million dollars. And I think that given the strong relationship that you have with Victor Ladipo in Oklahoma city, you could maybe talk him into like some sort of buyout number that you like and that he likes. And like I said, then you go work out on your own rehab on your own. Um, and then when you're healthy, sign with a contender and see if you can make some noise again. So I'd cut Victor Ladipo. You have Usman Gruba. And when I say cut Usman Gruba, you know, it could be a trade where you dump them off for like a second round pick or even a fake second round pick where it's like top 55 protected. Uh, and, and 
you know, you can cut him for two and a half million dollars or you can trade him, whatever. But I, I don't think Usman Garuba will be on the opening night roster. That's what I'm saying here as a broad term of cut. Jack White. Now, here's the, the kicker with Jack White. It just seems like what makes the most sense would be cutting Jack White and then getting him on a two-way deal. So as long as that works out with the whole 75K salary loophole, because we don't know exactly his official salary yet, but I would imagine it'll be that, that much guaranteed or below. I think that getting him on two-way deal would be beneficial because he can really help the OKC Blue. He can also be a guy that fills in whenever you have situations where injuries happen, whatever happens. Like Sam Presti has stressed the sky is going to fall on an NBA team twice in a season. When that sky falls, you know, uh, uh, Jack White can be someone who really helps you out on that two-way deal. And he's, and he's somebody that is eligible to be cut and put on a two-way deal. So that's three cuts out of five. Number four, I just think that they're going to waive Jeremiah Robinson Earl. He played one summer league game. That was kind of odd. $1.9 million, battling ankle injuries again. And as I said on the night that J-Will was drafted, drafting J-Will puts Jeremiah Robinson on the hot seat because they're so redundant. And they are redundant. And to this point, J-Will has been the better NBA player. And I still think that Jeremiah Robinson will have a good NBA career and will be a rotational NBA player. But he's going to be somebody that gets kind of squeezed out in OKC. And squeezing out in OKC is not some negative thing. It's just a, a matter of how much talent you've acquired and accumulated. So that's four of the five cuts. Cut number five, Ty Ty Washington. Now, I, I would more so see Ty Ty Washington at $2.3 million being traded again for the third time uh, this offseason and being traded to like a guard needy team for a second round pick and you uh, kind of make out on a couple second-round picks for getting Ty Ty. But that's the five. Victor, Usman Gruba, Jack White, Jerry, and Ty Ty. You can also consider that, like, what if these names were just all combined and do a trade um, like they did last year with, with Houston? I don't think that that will happen this year because, like, every team's at the selling floor already, so I don't really see the point or, like, how that makes sense for any side to do a, a trade like that where it's just easier for one to cut than the other. Um, but... Sure, I guess that you can consider that an option. But that's who I think's on the block. That's who I think will not make the cut, and that's the battles I'm watching in training camp. So I want you to drop down below right now on YouTube and on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Who would you cut from OKC on this roster right now? Also, Tuesday is a mailbag podcast, so drop your questions on YouTube and on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Wednesday... We're going to talk with a special guest about Casey Wallace. Thursday, we're going to discuss the rotations and where OKC stands in a very tough Western Conference. And then Friday, we have another special guest for you. It's another jam-packed week here on Lockdown Thunder on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. So make sure you subscribe anywhere you get your podcast from. Leave a five-star review on any podcasting platform. Leave a like, a comment on YouTube. And follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.